Hi everybody, it's Kate Luella here and I'm very glad to introduce you to Daniel J. Lewis of the Noodle Network. Noodle.mx is actually where he runs his podcasting networking from. And he also has a fantastic blog, the audacity to podcast.com, which is actually where I found him. And obviously you should check this site out if you're interested at all in podcasting because what he shares on his blog is nothing short of fantastic. In this interview, he explains why he set that blog up and what his blog post strategy is in relation to podcasting. He also has other podcast shows that he produces, but he has other people host them. He calls it his own network and he explains how he set that up. In particular, what I was interested to talk to him about though, and he explained in fantastic detail, is exactly how he does his live podcast show streaming, what he uses to record it, the pros and cons of doing live podcasts, and how he interacts live with his listeners while he's doing the show sort of like the talk back and he talks about the use of social media when he's looking for interaction from his listeners so without further ado here's Daniel talking about everything you've wanted to hear him talk about regarding podcasting particularly helpful for those of us who are starting out let's go are you there (laughs) yes how are you? Thank you so much for talking to me. I, yeah, you're welcome. I'm so grateful. No problem. Now, I, I definitely want to talk to you about live streaming because you've. I think you've got sort of a network of podcasts going. Is that right? Do you want to explain how that works and how you got into yeah. that? Yeah, I host a network called Noodle Mix Network, and that's named after um, a couple of things. My flagship first podcast I ever started was The Ramen Noodle, which is a clean comedy podcast. And I always liked the name Ramen Noodle. And I thought I want the network named something similar to that in some way. So I was thinking like ramen.com or noodle.com or and uh, trying to figure out what domains are available. And the word noodle does mean to think or to mull over an idea in your mind. And I realized, ooh, that fits really well because I wanted my podcast to be about um, stuff to make you think, laugh and succeed. So uh, Noodle Mix Network at noodle.mx is home to six podcasts right now, five of them actually being active and producing content on a regular basis. So five active podcasts. I'm looking to expand that as well. So d- that means that you set them up, but you have other people actually do the recording. Is that is that right? Or? Right. Three of the podcasts I host and produce, and then two of the other podcasts are hosted by uh, people I trust, their content and their production quality, and they record it themselves. They produce it themselves. They publish the episodes themselves. I provide technical support to them on the site because I'm now hosting their site, and there are mutual benefits to the relationship. Like They promote the network. I promote them, and uh, later on, I think later on on in our conversation, we'll talk more about like profit sharing and ownership and such. Right. But we set it up in a very win-win situation. Mm, that sounds fantastic. I never even thought of that. So that's a really interesting idea because I, I know your website, the Audacity to Podcast, I was just looking at it just before I came in. Straight away, I saw some things there like how to leave feed burner. You had a topic, a post on that. You had, should your podcast or blog have its own Twitter account and how to correct a podcast mistake after it's published? You know, these are all really interesting things that the average person is not going to have that depth of knowledge. So is that an intention of yours when you set up the Audacity podcast to make it a go-to place for help? Um Kind of. Well, there are, yes, several podcasts about podcasting. And what's awesome, like we are doing this new thing called Podcasters Roundtable, podcastersroundtable.com, where we're all working together. And in some ways, yes, we're competition with each other, Mm. but we're not rivals. Like we want each other to succeed and we are actively promoting each other and linking to each other in our own stuff. So in this space, and this is great advice, uh, for anyone else looking to podcast in a space that already has content Mm. is look for something that is unique, a unique approach. And that's when I was looking at getting into podcasting about podcasting, Mm. I was thinking, what's my unique approach to this? Mm. And my approach then, as you see with the audacity to podcast is it's unique in two ways. Mm. One, I'm the only podcast about podcasting that frequently features Audacity, and I base things a lot on how it works in Audacity. 
many of the principles apply to other programs too. And I mentioned other programs, but um, I used to include an audacity tip in every episode. Now what I do is every fifth episode is completely focused on audacity in some way. So it's a thorough discussion about how to do this in audacity or what new tool is available in audacity and all of that. So Focusing on the audacity was one approach that was making me unique. The other approach is I'm very analytical, very thorough when I make a decision. I do all of this research and study, and it takes me a while to make a decision mm -hmm. because I have to know all of my options, weigh things out. Yeah. And I decided I wanted to present this kind of information in a podcast about podcasting because the other podcasters give great advice, but sometimes I feel like they didn't mention something or yes, there's something else they could. Yeah. yeah. Or, or it's very focused and only one option. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes people need a couple choices. So yeah. I wanted to be, take a very how to approach mm -hmm. to things like not just saying, Oh yeah, use feed burner to set up your podcast or use power press. I wanted to say how. Yeah. What do does that, that mean? Exactly. exactly yes. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And of course, that's how I found your site when I was really struggling to get this PowerPress plugin sorted out. I, I understand what you're saying about audacity to podcast is kind of more about your personality and your attention to detail and, and you overanalyze. You know, I'm exactly the same. You know, if you and I were married, Daniel, we would fight constantly <laughs> because we'd be saying that's not good enough. I, I swear, I swear we'd, we'd clash on everything. I would love to talk to you more about live streaming and I'll, I'll just lay it out exactly what my concern is one is is it hard to set it up so if someone wants to do a podcast but make it live like an internet is that hard to actually set up and second of all is it I guess is it I'm not gonna say is it worthwhile but yeah is it worthwhile because perhaps doing it as a podcast is going to reach just as many people right or maybe it reaches more as a podcast as opposed to live radio because if they miss the episode in live I suppose then it becomes somewhere they can download later. But yeah, so could you explain all that? If, is that does that make sense? Yeah. Um, let me answer in reverse order. So okay. first, <laughs> is it worthwhile to live it's, stream? Okay, great. I think it is, but, and this is a huge but about this, yeah. live streaming, I would say, does not necessarily increase my audience. Mm. I think it gives me a better connection with my audience because my reason for live streaming my podcasts, um, the three podcasts that I host, mm. I live stream them when I record. So that's uh, the Audacity podcast, our clean comedy podcast, and our podcast about the TV show Once Upon a Time. Right. So we live stream those when we record and we get a better community when we do that because then people can respond to what we're saying immediately as we're saying it. Right. How do they do that? We have a chat room set up. So right. uh, all of our live shows are hosted at noodle.mx slash live. Okay, that's and your network. Live... Is, that, is that what that is or is that a shot? Yes. Okay. Yeah, noodle.mx is the network site and then each of the podcasts have their own separate sites. But okay. whenever we do a live show, I get it. it's okay. noodle.mx slash live. Yep. So people can go there and they can watch the video or they can switch over to the audio only version if they're internet doesn't support the video enough. And then they can listen live. There's only about a 20 second delay or so. And then they can chat with us. There's a chat room there that's really easy for someone to come on and type in what their name is, start chatting with us or chatting with the other people. Like we've got this podcast about once upon a time, the TV show. And so this is a lot of people who love sharing ideas and talking with other people who love the show. So sometimes while we're recording the podcast, the chat room is completely off on a different topic of something related to the show, but they're, they're talking with each other while we're talking about something else. Or, and so they're building community among themselves mm. and strengthening a relationship with us. And then sometimes for us too, we'll say something, we'll start talking and the chat room will respond and we can pull that in. So we might say, we think this is going to happen, but so-and-so in our chat room suggested that here's something else that could happen or mm. here's something else that works. Mm -hmm. So it's that engagement with the community. Mm. It does slightly have the approach of improving the audience in that when I tweet or share on Facebook that we're doing the live podcast. Mm. I know I have Twitter followers and Facebook people 
who do not subscribe to the podcast that is automatically receive each episode. They may not even know we podcast. They might just think we're talking about Once Upon a Time or we're whatever. Mm. So when I tweet that information, many times people will see a tweet and they'll think, oh, this looks interesting. They'll click on it, check it out, get to see us do it live. And then they realize, oh, this is this is actually people have come in the chat room. They've watched us and they've asked, what is a podcast? Yeah. Or what so are you doing been, here or something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So then we're converting people who just happen to stop by. Mm. We're converting them. Well, educating them on what a podcast is and converting them to a scri- subscriber, which they would not have otherwise been. Now, our Sorry, go on. our actual numbers of live streaming versus subscribers, live streaming is very, very small because we're not a major, major podcast like Leo Laporte's twit.tv is where he gets tens of thousands of viewers. Mm. But we get, it's a nice manageable community size for um, each podcast, it could be between 10 and 100 people in the chat room, which in a chat room, that's, that's plenty of people. Yeah, that's but fun. yeah, so it's, it builds community and interaction. And I would say it is worthwhile, if you want to have community and interaction with your podcast, which I do think everyone should. Mm, mm. I can see how that adds value, though, to the on the shoeing podcast that you put out through the RSS. Because you haven't just got up and said what you said and then posted it. It actually, like whoever's listening to the podcast later on probably has similar thoughts to what your chat room people did have. And that made their input poignant in that way that the future listeners got the value of the previous chat room people inspiring you to take your conversations in a different way. I can really see how that actually does benefit people yeah. later on. Yeah, exactly. Because it offers in different perspectives that maybe you didn't think of. So that's exciting. So what happens uh, is, do you ever make mistakes? I mean, that would be my main concern. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what kind of mistakes can you make? And what, yeah, give me some examples and how you handle it. It could be some of the same mistakes that could happen while podcasting. Like even if you're just recording offline somewhere in your closet, your cat could jump on your computer or mm. something could blow up in the house or yes. someone ring the doorbell, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that can happen. Some of that is actually great to leave in the podcast. Mm. Um, There was an episode of my clean comedy podcast that we were recording. And I have a a soundboard on my computer where I press a button and a sound effect plays. Right. And then I have a remote control for that on my iPad so that I can look at my iPad instead of look at my computer screen, look at my iPad and press the button. And I did something on my iPad while we were recording that accidentally played every single sound effect we had. Oh. <laughs> it, it ended up being absolutely hilarious right, right. to leave in on the podcast. Absolutely. And it was a mistake. Yeah. And the chat room was, we saw LOLs all over the place in the chat room yeah. and total interruption to what we were doing. But it was hilarious. So we left it in. So what about a mistake that was difficult or has there been that or not? You know, is it not that, does it not matter? Yeah, there have been other things like we might be going along talking and then suddenly realize, whoops, no, wait, I gave the completely wrong information there or I didn't say that right. Right. So it would be just like, again, recording a podcast where we might decide we'll just correct ourselves and move on or we might decide let's pause, let's say that again and we'll edit this later. Yep. The thing about the live stream is um, people come, they know, I think they have the expectation that they are seeing us raw Mm -hmm. and unprocessed and unfiltered, unedited. And that's part of what makes this really appealing to people is they enjoy seeing the behind the scenes. Mm. Like I produce audio podcasts. But when they come to the live show, they get to see the video. So they get to see, even though it's just a tiny little video on the page, they get to see what the studio looks like. Mm -hmm. They get to see us interact with each other when we make a funny face or when one of us looks like we fell asleep or something like that. They get to see that. Um, So when a mistake comes up, yeah, they they see that mistake. And uh, we're just, we're honest. We are authentic, but then sometimes we might decide that we're going to go back and edit that so when we publish it for people to download, that mistake won't be there. Mm. I mean, essentially what you're describing here is that there's no catastrophe that ever happens. They're just sort of, except for the occasional glitch that turns out to be hilarious, they're kind of like, oh, we probably should add in this as well, and then you go and do that, and then you move on. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. They're, they're seeing a behind the scenes kind of thing. Mm. So it's, it's okay to be much more natural and flowing. Right. And of course, you can edit that if you want to for the purpose of the, you know, the, the publishing of the podcast. Well, right. well, that's my next question. Does it automatically, what happens once you do that live show, you would then have to go and save that, wouldn't you? And then publish it through your RSS yourself manually. Is that right? Right. The way that we're doing it is, and this kind of starts tying into your second question that I hadn't answered yet. Is it hard? Right. Um, the way we're doing it is we use two services to live stream. So we use Mixler for audio and livestream.com for the video. Um, that way people can choose when they come to the site, they can watch the video and listen, or they can just listen depending on their internet connection. Right. But those services do record what we're doing, mm -hmm. but I don't use those recordings unless there's some catastrophe here that my recording failed. Instead, what I'm doing is here in my studio, I record what we're uh, talking and saying, that's what I edit. And that's what I release. Okay. So yeah, so uh, I, I don't, I got questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Mixler and Livestream.com, do they cost you money to use them? They have paid services, but I'm using their free services. Um, okay. On Mixler, for example, mm -hmm. you get a really nice experience. Mixler is audio only. Okay. But uh, it's really easy to use. Mm -hmm. And it even works on mobile platforms too, like an iPad that doesn't have flash. Okay. So I really I like that because a lot of people are using mobile devices. Yes. But um, Mixler, yeah, completely free to use. No ads for Mixler. Mm -hmm. You can pay $5 a month for Mixler and you get extra features like higher quality audio. You get to, uh, I think it's higher quality download. Like you could have them handle the recording of your podcast and then you download it from them. You get extra abilities if you pay with Mixler. Mm. Live stream and Ustream are very similar. Mm -hmm. um, both of those services are what I would recommend in general because they both uh, work on mobile platforms as well. Okay, so so um, Mixler is only audio, but live stream and Ustream are both video. Is that right? Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And they are free, but there are ads. Okay. So when someone comes to my live page and the video is running. They'll typically see a pre-roll ad that starts before they get to start watching us. Okay. Ustream actually interrupts content with ads, which I don't like. So that's why I, for now, am not using Ustream at all mm -hmm. because I don't want people to miss my content because it was interrupted with an ad. The pre-roll, I don't mind. Lower thirds where a little ad pops up, kind of like you see on YouTube sometimes. Yeah. I don't mind that either. It's a free service that's really valuable. I don't mind ads as long as it's not interrupting the content. Mm. So that's why I'm using live stream. Yeah, I think that's great. And live stream, do they have a paid option or? Yes. Right. And it can get expensive depending on your needs. Depending on what you're uh, using. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they do have a free option where you point people to their website instead of your own website Good. to be able to watch the live stream. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I want everyone coming to my website mm. to view my content. So that's why I don't use that particular option they have, but they do then have premium services where you can embed it on your own website and not have ads, but then you start paying by either um, how many viewers you have or how long you broadcast and it can get really expensive. Right. Mixly you say is audio and live stream is video, but when you publish this through the RSS, are you just publishing the video or the video and the audio separately? I mean, because there is an MP3 and an MP4 file there, isn't there? And right. Well, when I publish for people to get the podcast, I'm publishing only the audio. Okay, uh, great. So but if they when, want the video, they get it on your site. If they want the video, they come to the live show. I do not republish the, the video. video at all. Yeah, it, okay. it is recorded and I save it, but it's really... Okay. I don't think what we're doing, I don't think our video is valuable enough for people to download it after the fact. It's fun to watch live. Yeah. But it's but you're just, just sitting in a studio, so. Yeah, exactly. We don't have stuff on the screen. Usually we don't have stuff on the screen. We're not doing, you know, lower thirds or transitions between camera angles and all of that. Some people do, and that's awesome. Right. Um, we are primarily audio, so we distribute the audio. But for people yeah. who decide to join us live, they get that extra thing of they get to see us. Right. So do, you obviously don't publish it on YouTube. Right. Now, 
we are <laughs> working on some separate content yeah. for publishing on YouTube. I'll but try and do right, that, definitely, yeah. yeah. One last thing, what do you use to record the audio and what do you use to record the video even though you don't publish it at the moment? For the audio, I'm using an external recorder. So I've got several microphones and a mixer and all of the stuff connected together. And live streaming with a fully produced sounding podcast, like with music and intros and bumpers and voicemails and live calls and all of that, yes. gets complicated. Right. The yep. more you want to do in your podcast, the more complicated it is to do it and the harder it will be. Yeah. So because of all of this, I've got everything going through a mixer and then going into an external recording. And I use a Zoom H4N portable audio recorder. You could also get something else that's smaller or a little bit cheaper. But everything records into that. And then when we're finished with the podcast, I copy the file off of the recorder onto my computer where I then edit it and convert it to the proper format and post it. When you say the proper format, you meant MP3? Right. Right. Yes. Okay. We, I just let the program I'm live streaming with record the video. And like I said, I don't use that yet. I sometimes think about using it, but there have been a couple, well, one time where I did have to go to the recorded video to recover some audio because we had a power failure and I lost my local audio recording, but the video was saved. So uh, I was able to go strip the audio from that and use that in my podcast. And no one ever noticed that it came from a different source. Mm. Um, but that's just recorded with whatever program we're using to live stream. So like, uh, Ustream and Livestream and Mixler all have their own programs that you install on your computer right. on a Windows or a Mac computer, mm -hmm. and it will handle the live streaming for you, but it can also record for you, okay. and it records at the quality that you are live streaming. Mm -hmm. So it, it saves that um, one program, like Livestream, saves it as a file to my computer. Ustream saves it as a video to their website, but I can go back and re-download that later if I want it. Well, that's good. I mean, that's that's absolutely fantastic. So if someone did want to set up a live stream, though, of their podcast, I'm just thinking, how would they do that? Because they're not you. They don't have this network set, set up. They Do they go to Blog Talk Radio? I mean, how would they do that as a lay person who has no podcasting background? I would not recommend Blog Talk Radio if they if they just want to live stream their own audio. Blog Talk Radio's good use is if you want to take live calls. But please, please, this is my plea to people who out there who are thinking yeah. of podcasting. Do not publish the audio that Blog Talk Radio records. It's phone call quality. Right. You can get much better quality from the cheap internal microphone on your computer than you can from Blog Talk Radio's phone call quality. Right. So please don't publish that. But it can be something you could use that when you do your show live, you're recording to something else uh, in higher quality what you're going to publish, but then you use maybe Blog Talk Radio or Mixler for people to be able to listen live and call in live. But right. for simplicity, yeah, for simplicity, for someone who wants to look into doing this live, mm. Blog Talk Radio, yes, is an option. I think it costs, though, um, Right. For almost any way that you want to do it. But Mixler is free. Mixler is audio only. It doesn't have all the live call in features that Blog Talk Radio does. Oh. But if you're just doing a solo podcast and you don't need the live call ins or anything like that, then Mixler works great. Mm. You can, when you use Mixler, it's really easy to set up. I would say Mixler is the easiest way to live stream audio. Super easy to set up. You can point people to a page on Mixler and they give you a link that they say, share this on Facebook and Twitter, and people can listen, they can go to that page to listen. Or if you have your own website, you can copy and paste some code that Mixler will give you, paste it into your site, and then you could have a live page. And when people visit that page while you're doing this live, people can listen. And uh, Mixler even has this cool thing that if you integrate with Facebook, it will live stream your audio right into Facebook. Well, I was going to say tools like Twitter and Facebook would really give you the interaction tool that you need. It's just more so the ability to get the live stream out. And of course, podcasting tradition is pre-recorded and you publish it. So it's really, so you're saying that Mixler is your key to doing that. Yeah. If you want to do live audio, mm. uh, then I think Mixler is the best way to go. If it's just you and you're just 
streaming out yeah. there. If you need to be able to take live calls and screen yeah. calls and stuff, then blog talk radio can work well too. But you're saying that's not a great thing. Often the sound's not great. And it's not, I just don't think it's necessary. Can I, I want to move on a bit briefly now and go on to some podcasting from your perspective you said you've got your your network does Mm -hmm. that mean so how are you hosting your files how have you set up your podcast your five i think you said you had five podcasts how are you setting them up to hold the files okay hold on tight here because this has (laughs) this has several answers okay um i have my own website on domains that i control and that's powered by wordpress right and then the main thing inside of WordPress that makes podcasting possible is this plugin called PowerPress. Yep. And that turns the RSS feed that WordPress already produces into a podcast RSS feed that you can submit to iTunes. So my website is running WordPress and I have a web hosting account somewhere. Really easy to set up WordPress with web hosting accounts in that. Then the actual files, the MP3 files that I'm producing are hosted with Libsyn, that's Mm L-I-B-S-Y-N. They are a media host that is specifically designed for podcasters. Because here's what happens with when a podcaster produces a file, they upload it to somewhere. And then within the first week of that file being available, it's in very high demand. So you might have, if you have a thousand subscribers or listeners, Mm. you post that episode and within two days, that file needs to be downloaded 2,000 times or 1,000 times across the world and it needs to be downloaded quickly. And many web hosting companies do not like it when you host high demand multimedia files on their site. They're not set up for that kind of thing. Yeah. Some places are okay with it, but you always need to have a backup plan. So that's why Libsyn works great. That Libsyn uh, is a flat fee that you only charge a certain amount per month. And that's based on how much you upload to their site. It's You are not charged based on how many people download your episode. Mm-hmm. So if you pay their $5 a month plan, you could be paying $5 a month if you have just one person download your episode or if you have a billion people download your episode, it's still $5 a month. Yeah. There are other services like Amazon S3, that people talk about where it sounds like it could be a really inexpensive option. You know, it's pennies per gigabyte of storage and bandwidth. Mm. But how quickly do Mm. you use that up? And I'm working on a a nice little formula that will calculate this out. But Mm -hmm. what you have to remember is that when if you released uh, an, an episode every week for a year, then you look at this month, people are still going to be downloading your old episodes. As well. So, yeah. Yeah. Your your needs for storage and for bandwidth will Gross. grow yes. exponentially. Good point. Not just yeah. It's not a flat growth. It's exponential growth. Mm. So you might need a gigabyte of bandwidth this month. Next month, you need two gigabytes. Next month, the month after that, three gigabytes. So that's why a media hosting service like Libsyn works really well for that. Mm. And um, I have a promo code too. If people want to try Libsyn out and they can get their first month for free Mm. if they enter the promo code noodle. Okay. And uh, it's really inexpensive. You can even host your podcast website with them. They give you a lot of control and they make some things really easy that if you don't want to mess with web hosting, don't want to mess with setting up WordPress and PowerPress and all of this, Mm. then I would say Libsyn is the best way to go because they give you all of these controls. It's designed by podcasters for podcasters Mm. and it's really the best value for Mm. podcast hosting. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think that um, it was so easy, you know. You know, mentioning a blog spot or, or something like that that's hosted com. by, yeah, WordPress.com or anything like that. Yeah. That works great for combining with uh, Libsyn where yeah. instead of hosting a website with Libsyn, you just upload your file and use them just as a media host. So yes. you upload your file so it's just downloadable. Mm. And then you copy the link or the code that they give you and paste that into WordPress.com or Blogspot, or anything like that. <clears throat> so you mean, you, you mean the player? Are you talking about the player? Yeah, yeah, just the link to the file, the MP3 file. Right. And post that into your Blogspot. That way you have all of your content on one place. So if you've got a blog that you've built up an audience, a faithful audience for a couple of years, and then you decide to start podcasting on the same topic, well, you don't want to tell people, yeah, go over to this other website and subscribe to this other website in no, order to get my podcast. No, It'd be great if you just start telling them, it's right here, right now, the 
podcast is here. So you can use Libsyn to host your MP3 files. Yes. And then link to them from the website that you already have. Yeah. Well, the way I did it, um, I set up the Libsyn and I, I published the RSS feed from the Libsyn. Okay. But within the Libsyn settings, I said my website is my Blogspot blog. So if anyone in iTunes clicks on that website link within iTunes, it goes to my Blogspot blog. It doesn't go to Libsyn's blog, which is perfect. And then within my Blogspot blog, I embed the player in every post that I publish. So if they subscribe to my blog, they'll get it that way. And if they subscribe through iTunes directly to the RSS feed, they'll automatically get that because Libsyn are pushing it out. I didn't even go through FeedBurner, but that's because I sort of, or maybe I did go through FeedBurner. I can't remember. It doesn't really matter. And the way that you're doing that is beautiful. That is exactly what I'm talking about, that if you don't want to mess with hosting your own website or if you've already got a website somewhere, the way you just described is the way to go oh, cool. because <laughs> then you have full control. If you ever decide to change anything, Libsyn gives you a full control yes. over your feed. So it's actually good that you're not using FeedBurner yep. uh, in that case, yep. that you use your Libsyn feed. You have total control over that to redirect it or change it, do anything you want with it. Mm -hmm. But then, like you said, you're sending people to your actual Blogspot blog and website and posting the player over there, embedding it. That is perfect. That's yeah. the way to do it. Do you believe podcasting's helped you achieve things? Yeah, so, definitely. Okay. Um, in, in my case, podcasting is how I make money. Sort of. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I am a self-employed web design entrepreneur. Right. And I podcast. Okay. And most of my uh, customers and clients come from people who listen to me in my podcast. Now, oh. I don't advertise my services a whole lot. I often forget to advertise my services, actually. But um, in for the Audacity to Podcast, for example. Yeah. In there, I tell people if you need podcast cover art designed or if you need help doing these things that I'm explaining how you can do it yourself, or if you want to hire someone to do it, please give me a call. So people are listening to my content. They are getting to know me because they're hearing my voice. You can get to know someone so much better by listening to their voice mm. than you can just by reading blog posts from them. Mm. So they're, they're interacting with me back and forth with emails or voicemails that I answer in the podcast or this different stuff. So they, they're building a relationship with me and a relationship of trust. Mm. So when they decide I want to start a website or I need something designed, they come to me because they already know me. They trust me. Yeah. They know it's something I can do. Yeah. So in my case, the audacity to podcast was the the springboard for me to be able to leave my full-time job and go into full-time self-employment because I had an audience of people who were loving the content I was producing as well as they were eager to hire me to do stuff for them. Mm. And I didn't have time to do that until actually I, I left my regular job mm. and went self-employed. So that's one way that people can benefit from it. Other ways are affiliate sales, or uh, which is where you refer someone to buy something else and you get a small portion of it back. Mm -hmm. Or you might have a sponsor or an advertiser in your podcast where you get paid based on how many episodes you produce or maybe how many people download the episode. Mm -hmm. There can be things like that as opportunities for people, but that's where you earn money directly from the podcast. But then there are all of these indirect methods. Like for me, it's um, building my personal brand so that when people need a website designed, they tend to come to me. If they listen to my content, they think of me when they need a website design. There are other things too, like people, I have friends who are getting book deals or uh, speaking gigs or all of this because they have become an expert in their field by starting a podcast. Right. And the podcasts tend to stick out more because that's where people communicate more naturally. Mm -hmm. They communicate with their own voice. It's really a lot like giving a public speaking session Yeah. where people come, they sit, they listen and learn from you. And so that's why podcasting can really put you out there as a content expert more than just blogging. Yeah. Because people hear your voice, they hear your personality, they get to hear how you present yourself and how knowledgeable you are, how passionate you are about what you're saying. Exclamation points in a blog post just don't communicate the passion well enough. Yeah. But in podcasting, you can hear when someone's smiling, when they're sad, when they're not feeling well, all of that. So it's it's natural, authentic, and that can help you build your own brand to 
open up opportunities to be an expert in that field, to write books, to produce videos, to produce training products, to be hired to do something related to it. Mm. There are so many indirect ways to make money from mm. a podcast. It's not just sponsorship or selling podcast episodes. No, there is a lot of ways. And I just want to talk to you about affiliates. This is one thing. That, do you, so do you have call to actions in your podcast show to go to perhaps your blog to click on a link that then is an affiliate link? So, I mean, you may disclose it as an affiliate link. That's, that's not a problem, but is that the way you would do? I mean, just trying to get in my mind how you would effectively, or if you have, perhaps you can draw on an experience where you've promoted something or sold something that did have an affiliate link and how you went about doing that with your listeners. Yeah, there are several ways that you could do this. Um, okay. The Audacity to Podcast is a good example of this because frequently I talk about specific tools, software or hardware or whatever that people could use for podcasting. Right. And whenever I mention a tool, I try to find an affiliate link for that. So I can tell them, uh, if you want to purchase this microphone, mm. then go to the audacitypodcast.com slash whatever. Yeah. And I have purchase links there where you can get the lowest price at different sites or something like that. Right. So it might be that I'm reviewing a product mm. or I mention a product mm. and I include the affiliate link there. It could also be something where uh, many podcasters do this, where they kind of treat an affiliate link like a sponsorship. Right. Uh, for example, you could go to the audacity to podcast.com slash audible mm. and you can sign up to become an audible affiliate where you get paid $15 whenever someone joins Audible as a free trial member. You right. get paid. They are free trial members. Now, most likely they'll end up staying and enjoy it. Yeah. But so that's something where you could say at, in your episode, you could say something about, it wouldn't be proper to say we're sponsored by Audible. No. But you could say, please sign up for a free Audible trial and your membership, uh, help support this show. Right. You could mention a specific audiobook that you're enjoying or you think people might enjoy or you could just mention it and as almost as if it's an advertisement in the podcast you mm -hmm. could do that. Mm. But it's not anything that you actually have an advertising agreement with anybody. No. You get paid based on how your audience reacts to it. Yes. And do you find that you you the audience do often do those calls to actions? Especially when it's relevant. Yeah. So when I mention in my Once Upon a Time podcast, for example, mm -hmm. I think one time in a podcast I mentioned this and I might have shared it on the blog or in tweets. I've said uh, an audiobook that was a fairy tales audiobook mm. and a bunch of people signed up, downloaded it. Mm. Uh, something far more relevant, Once Upon a Time, the TV series just released its first season on DVD mm. and Blu-ray. So as soon as we had pre-order links, we told people you can pre-order the season and get it as soon as it comes out by going to oncepodcast.com slash season one. Mm. And a lot of people placed the pre-order because that was content. That was something that our audience was eager to purchase. I don't think you get any more relevant than that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like almost desirable. <laughs> No, that's awesome. Now, the only thing that I, I wonder, and like those sales, even the affiliate link, it's not going to be big, big sales. So I'm wondering whether you ever do a cross promotion maybe with someone who has a product that sells for like $1,000. Maybe it's a coaching program or something. And that way you only have to get one person to sign up and you've made $500 from that podcast. Is that ever anything you've done? I haven't necessarily. There have been a couple of things like uh, my friend Cliff Ravenscraft does this occasional thing where he has uh, people get together and for a month they get to learn mm. all about how to podcast, yes. which is awesome. I don't have the time to do that. Right. So when people want to join, I recommend them to join that. Mm. And I have a coupon code. So it benefits them if they use my coupon code. Mm. And it benefits me too. I get paid if they use the coupon code, they save money, and they get some great content and great training from a guy who really knows his stuff and yeah. stuff. It's training and content that I don't have the time to produce. So I'd rather point them to someone who can yeah. And then that it helps me back with affiliate income. Yeah, that helps too. Because I think this is something that people should look at doing, uh, not to take away from doing other great shows.
those, you know, you wouldn't just want to go and do one of those every week. You'd want to mix it all up so that overall the listener was getting a great, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I mean, you, you can't sit there and promote product after product. No one will subscribe. Here's a smaller scale idea that's still relevant to podcasters. Quite frequently, web hosting companies offer an affiliate program that could pay $50 to $100 per sale. And if you host your website with the company, you're happy. if a podcaster mentions this regularly in their episode or in their show notes or has the little badge on their website, people get to know that that's available. And people, listeners will generally want to support the podcast that they listen to. So when a listener thinks... I'm going to start a website. What What's a website hosting company that people recommend? And then they might remember, oh, yeah, that podcast I listened to, they say that they really like this web host, so I'm going to use their link. And that could pay, like I said, $50 to $100 per person. Yeah. I do want to just very briefly talk about, and then we're finishing up, uh, return on investment. We've sort of discussed that a little bit already. So, Do you watch your analytics? Is that something you do? I do. Um, I'm not obsessed about them. And I really suggest that others not be obsessed about analytics either. What I watch for in analytics are trends. Um, I watch for growth. I watch for what episodes are more popular, what kind of content is more popular. I watch for how people are coming to my content. What I want to see yes. is I want to see a continual rise in subscribers or downloads. I want to see what content people like and then try and produce more of that content that's relevant to them and that people are searching for and it's helping them out. I measure that in several different ways, uh, like website visitors. I use Google Analytics for podcast download stats. I use actually both Blueberry's free stats service as well as Libsyn's uh, built-in service that if you use them for media hosting, you get to see their great stats. Yeah. Between those two, you could also use FeedBurner for RSS stats, but it's more of a guideline, not, not at all accurate numbers. Yeah. Uh, so between the website stats and the media stats, I have a real good idea of my audience, where they're coming from, how they're getting to my site, what content is popular, and how my audience is growing. So why do you listen to both Blueberry and Blibson? Aren't they the same stats? Are they different, are they? They're about the same. They both continually refine their systems. And uh, for one thing, I haven't been with Libsyn for forever. Wow. I've been with Blueberry for almost forever. Wow. So I have a lot longer of a history of stats over at Blueberry. And each of them provides stats in a slightly different way that um, – for example, I would say that Libsyn is better at showing me the day-to-day -day stats. I can see this episode was downloaded 500 times on day one, 200 times on day two, 100 times on day three, and whoa, 600 times on day seven. What's up with that? You know, I can <laughs> see that and see that, wow, something got popular with this episode. But then like with Blueberry, I can see a lot better of an overall picture of how my podcast is doing that. I can see this particular podcast has been downloaded. All of its episodes have been downloaded um, 10,000 times mm. or this particular episode has been downloaded um, 500 times last month and 200 times this month, that kind of thing. So I yeah. like using them both. Mm. Blueberry also has uh, even more advanced premium stats that they're right about to upgrade. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. But okay. they're, they're both very similar and it's not necessary to use both. I just, I've been with one longer than the other and I like continuing to use both and just kind of comparing between them. But look, you're a podcaster and as you said, you podcast about podcasting. So it's kind of poignant and profound that you do that. Whereas I think a lot of my target demographic would just have one and that's, you know, that's right. But barely even look at that. So when you talk about shows that do well, I know you do cover art for, for podcasts. As you know, when people, there's icons in iTunes and getting that to looking great is so important. Do you know when I'm browsing through iTunes, honest? If I don't see cover art, I just don't go into that podcast show. It's that, you know, important to me. Um, I yeah. don't know about you. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, so if you did a tutorial about the cover art, 
Is that something you would do and then publish it? Is that something that would be popular? Uh, yeah, that would be one thing, uh, okay. especially since I've kind of cornered this niche of podcast cover art. Like I own the domains, podcast cover art, podcast album art, podcast oh. artwork.com. I own all of those domains. Oh, yes. Um, and I'm kind of trying to corner that niche of design. Yeah. And so I do have plans to release an ebook that I'm going to sell of how someone could design their own podcast cover art, like what things to keep in mind, right. what the specifications should be, what to do, what not to do, what the tools could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I do have planned in mind to release that as an ebook to sell. Mm -hmm. Also, around the same time that I release that, I would do a podcast episode mm -hmm. talking about it in a more of a, a brief uh, explanation. Mm. But then even like if people buy the ebook and they decide, wow, this, I, I can't still do don't this have or, time. It's going to be a yeah. thing too, you know? Yeah. Then I would give them a discount if they want to hire me to design the cover art for them. Oh, that's a great. So thing. that, yeah, that kind of content, I think that would be really popular because no one else out there has really covered it in depth. Mm. And that's with many of the content that I've released, many of them, yeah, people uh, are not covering it in such depth. And that's why I'm trying to form this, my own approach, my own unique spin on things mm -hmm. is finding that stuff that others haven't covered or haven't covered to this depth yes. and share that so that then when people look for it on the internet, yep. they'll find it, they'll get their answers that they need and they'll be able to go from there. Yeah. And they'll think of you. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I actually saw the cover up page of what you did and it's brilliant. And I, I must admit that, it, uh, like I said, if someone doesn't have a cover art, I won't even go into it. And if I see it and it looks really bad, it also puts me off. So I think it is a very visual thing on iTunes when it comes to subscribing. I don't know about actually downloading a show because if you're doing search based on keywords, then cover art's not that important because you're looking for the keywords. But often you're just browsing categories. And um, so I'd definitely be recommending to anyone that does my course that they get you know, get something up there as an image to enhance their, their listeners or their subscribers. So just one last thing then. with your, Let's say, for instance, you've got a 1,000 subscribers. Does that mean that, sh that podcast show will get about 2,000 downloads? Is that a rough rule of thumb that you double it? Generally, yeah. It, it depends on where you're getting that information about subscribers. Right. Probably it's from FeedBurner. And right. FeedBurner is a service that allows you to run your RSS feed through them and then distribute that. And they offer other things with that that I don't recommend anymore. Like I do not recommend using FeedBurner's SmartCast feature mm. if you have your own website with PowerPress. Mm. Um, otherwise, you might need it. But yeah, it gives you some information, which it's a guideline. It is not accurate because it's a measurement of how many programs out there checked your RSS feed on a particular day. Mm. So if you have a thousand yesterday mm. and a thousand today, mm. that could be 2000 people who a thousand of them closed their program today and a thousand of them closed their program yesterday. So it or there could be crossover. The RSS stats are really not accurate. So whatever number you see, do know that your actual subscribers and actual listeners are higher than that. Yeah. About double. Yeah, that's a good guideline. Um, but the best place to get your information would be your actual media stats because that is how many people downloaded the episode. Yeah. And that's uh, much more trackable too that you can see not just – how many people downloaded it today, mm. but you can see how many people downloaded it total, how many unique uh, IP addresses, so how many unique computers out there mm. downloaded the episode. And that gives you a better idea of that's about what your subscriber number is. So you're obviously getting a lot more downloads than what you have subscribers because people who subscribe won't necessarily listen, but a lot of people will listen and not subscribe because they're just and, yeah. And the people, if you write good show notes, like almost a blog post to go along with your um, podcast, certainly like getting in that nice search engine optimization there, keywords and such. Mm -hmm. If you write a blog post, people will find your site through Google. And when they come to your site, hopefully you have a play button on your site for your podcast. Mm -hmm. If someone presses play and they listen to the podcast through your website, mm -hmm. that does not count as a subscriber. So a little tip here is if someone does this, mm. remember that not everyone listening to your episode is a subscriber. So every now and then encourage people to subscribe yeah. so they automatically receive your content. But RSS subscription stats completely ignore the website plays 
But download stats like Libsyn or Blueberry do track that information. And you can actually yep. see that. You can see, oh, I got 70% uh, of my subs uh, downloads were from iTunes. 20% mm. were people who went to the website and pressed play. And 10% were these other things. Yeah, which is fantastic. I actually put in a little pod track player. Have you seen those little free pod track players with the little shows in the? Yeah. It's awesome. And of course, that's free. Now, when I set that up, I'm putting in my RSS feed from Libsyn. So that's still going to count to my Libsyn stats, even though it's a completely independent player. Correct. Yeah. So that's yeah. It, that's what you want. Yeah. And anywhere you use that um, address that Libsyn gives you for the MP3 file, yeah, it will count towards your stats. Yes. Exactly. And, you know, this is the beauty for bloggers, and this is what I'm going to be promoting to bloggers, Daniel, and I suggest you do too, <laughs> is that when someone does a, a show like together, so for me, I'm going to do blogger interviews. When I interview a blogger, I'm going to then get co co copy and paste that code of the wizard player in Libsyn, give it to them and say, can you put this in your blog post? So they say, I did an interview today with Kate and here it is, play. And so even though they're playing it from someone else's blog, not mine, it's also still going to my stats, you know. Exactly. And I'm tapping into their audience. That's really kind of the strategically why I'm doing it, but it's obviously a lot of other benefits. You okay. to, What are you doing today? Are you going out doing anything? Are you Friday. Right. Yeah, Friday afternoon. Um, what I do on Fridays is I work in the morning and then Friday afternoon is time that my wife and I spend together. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's awesome. Well, there you go. You don't have children? No, we don't. No, because you haven't mentioned them something. <laughs> you had them, you'd mention them. So they run your life once you have them. So that's it's all right. funny that just before I talked to you, I was actually talking to another Australian, um, uh -huh. one of my other podcasters on the network, the guy that hosts ChristianMeetsWorld.com right. uh, is from Australia. Who's that? And Who's... Jason Rennie. Okay. Haven't heard of him. No, nope. that's all right. Uh, um, he's in, I think, Brisbane. Okay. Yep. Because I'm in Melbourne, but yeah. So he's in the sunny state. He's doing well. I'm down with the rain at the moment. It's freezing at the moment. So and is there any other Aussies you deal with as a podcaster or is that just it, just really? Um, there, uh, have you seen the podcast, Podcast Like a Radio DJ? Is that Dan Lyons? Yes, Dan Lyons. Yes. Uh, look, I haven't spoken to him, but I have seen him around and people have mentioned him yet. Yeah, he and I have talked. Um, we did uh, Dan Lyons, Dave Jackson, Ray Ortega and I hosted a panel, uh, two panels actually, at Blog World in New York City earlier this year about uh -huh. podcasting. And that was uh -huh. a lot of fun. Yeah. So he was actually obviously over in New York City. So that's great. That'd be great. But that's all. No, okay. that's it. Fantastic. All right. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Talk to you soon. Bye.